Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to, to thank the Banco Central de, de Chile for, for inviting me. The topic today is fintech and financial stability. Fintech is clearly a very hot topic. Uh, the expectations are very high. As you know, some people think technology will solve many problems that we have today in the world, like uh, lack of financial inclusion, too many underbanked people. So the hopes are high that this will change. There's also a big uh, discussion about fintech and uh, financial sustainability. The, the hope that uh, the infrastructure gap uh, that exists around the world will be closed thanks to uh, innovative technology. And, and lastly, there are a lot of people who think that fintech in particular, blockchain, will lead to a, a more fair and a more just, more democratic financial system where the benefits are spread more evenly than, uh, than they have been in the past. So the hopes are high. Of course, not all of these hopes Will, will be met. The, the topic for today is financial stability and, and fintech, so a more uh, down-to-earth topic. So, so I, I started to work uh, on, on fintech about a year ago when I moved to the, to the Peterson Institute and uh, more on a personal level, I was, when I started it, I was not aware <laughs> that the fintech world is quite different to what I was used to. I mean, my background is pretty similar to many people in, in, in the room. Uh, I, I went to conferences in the central bank community, international organizations, academic conferences. Uh, I used to, to read uh, working papers, articles in journals, financial times. And when I moved to fintech, I very quickly realized that this world is quite different. For instance, if I wanted to gather information, I would not find it usually in working papers from universities or international institutions. I had to go to blog posts, to Twitter posts, and uh, <coughs> go through all the threads uh, and comments in, in, on these blogs. And this became my main source of information. But also at the conferences, many people dressed differently than I was used to. You see it here. These are two, two photos I took at the FinTech event in, uh, in New York a couple of months ago. Uh, this is a panel pretty much <laughs> to the setup we have here. Uh, on, on the left, you see uh, a very successful uh, CEO of, of a startup that provides uh, artificial intelligence and big data analysis to two clients. Actually, the, the, guy, the guy in the suit next to him is, is his client. Uh, and uh, he has, uh, he has uh, the startup has two clients, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. And the guy in the sandal says, you know, it's great. I don't want more clients, the, the two of the most important financial institutions uh, are my clients and th that's enough. The person on the right is, uh, is Joe Lubin. He is uh, one of the, the first people that got into Ether, the digital currency, second largest digital currency. Now he has a startup of his own uh, providing advisory services to uh, initial coin offerings. He's, he's very wealthy. Before he got into this, he was producing music in Jamaica, but he is one of the, the big stars of the scene. Also, he walks around in, <laughs> in some uh, colorful t-shirts, usually with a backpack, very unassuming, very modest person. And I think that's really what, what is driving the, the industry is that these people are different than the typical bankers. <coughs> it's also pretty clear that these two guys will not want to work for a big financial institution. They like to be on their own and to have their own uh, microcosmos and do, they do great work. 
It's not so uncommon. For instance, if you look at uh, how the, the computer industry evolved, as, as an example, in, in the 70s, computers were at universities and at the defense ministry. And they were connected to a version of what would later become the internet, the opranet. And uh, there was some discussion, should personal computers be developed? The incumbent PC producers, they all, uh, the incumbent computer producers, they all had no interest. There is a, is a quote from the president of, uh, of DEC in 1974 where he said, I, I don't see any reason why anyone would want a computer of his own. So the incumbents were change averse. They said, we have computers at, uh, at universities and at the defense departments, and this will not change. Obviously, we all know what happened. There were some, some offsprings of hippies and uh, people with uh, liberal ideas about uh, freedom and so on, who started to develop PCs in, in the garages of, of their parents. And we all know the incumbent, the old style computer producers, they disappeared and a totally new industry uh, was developed. And I think this is pretty likely to be going on right now. The banks seem to be <laughs> very slow I, I know quite a few people who work on fintech projects in bank, and most of them leave pretty quickly because they say the pace is simply too slow. We need authorization for every project we want to do. We have to ask compliance. And so they all leave and they, they, <coughs> they open their own companies. So I, in the discussion of are the banks behind the curve, I do think they are behind the curve just because they are so big. And, uh, and so uh, I think it's a, it's a great uh, place really for, uh, for startups to be successful and they will shape the industry. Okay, so this, this graph here I took from, uh, from a report from, from IOSCO that came out about uh, a year ago, a research report. That, that basically shows what, what we all know, right? On, on the, the left-hand side, uh, we have FinTech investments in uh, 2005. So we have in 2005, uh, worldwide, we have uh, 1,600 FinTech firms uh, with funding of 5 billion. Then 2010, this goes up to uh, 3,000 firms and funding of 15 billion. And uh, today, meaning 2016, they say it's more than 8,000 fintech firms worldwide with a funding of over one, 100 billion. You see also these clusters of lines. Uh, the, these, are, these show how much money is going into, into the sector. So the biggest one on the very right there on the upper left side, the purple cluster, this is fintech related to payments. And then the one next to it, the, the red one, is uh, uh, investments in, in blockchain technology uh, that uh, took off uh, after 2010. Speaking of blockchain, uh, every software developer that is currently in, at the university is taking blockchain courses. And I think that's also new. If you are on the job markets, that's the hottest field where you can be at. I, I hear figures of starting salaries in, in the blockchain field for software developers of $200,000. And that's a lot even for, for software developers. So demand is extremely high. Every developer uh, is doing blockchain courses, even those who left university uh, a few years ago, they take evening classes in blockchain, and I think this shows how much energy is going into the, the blockchain system. <laughs> the FSB uh, has, in my view, uh, published the best report on uh, fintech and financial stability. 
It came out in, uh, 2000, uh, in June 2017. And what we, the FSB distinguishes uh, five economic functions that uh, in, in the fintech area. You see them here up uh, on the screen. The first one is uh, payment clearing and settlement. Uh, it's mostly in the retail area. Uh, we have all heard of, uh, of Alipay, Google Pay, uh, PayPal, uh, Samsung Pay, uh, BitPesa, M-Pesa. Uh, mobile payments, so that's one of the, the big areas of innovation. Then the, the second one is deposit lending and uh, capital raising. That's uh, basically uh, market-based lending, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending and uh, crowd crowdfunding. Then market support uh, is uh, services like uh, <coughs> cloud computing, or uh, all the, the, the technologies that make, uh, make the markets function, function better. Uh, investment management and investor services is the fourth economic function. Uh, topics like robo-advisory, uh, big data uh, analysis, and so on uh, are, are relevant there. And the, the fifth one is uh, insurance. These are uh, Internet of Thing devices that, that help insurance companies uh, to, uh, to gauge the risks uh, better. For instance, uh, Fitbit watches that uh, are an indication of, of how, how healthy your lifestyle is, and this has an implication on your uh, health insurance. There's another report by IOSCO uh, that came out a little bit earlier in February last year. It has to focus on, uh, on what is relevant for the securities uh, uh, market supervisors. Uh, they come up with a pretty similar uh, <coughs> distinction among, among the functions, slightly different because it's based on, on securities. The first one is also innovation in uh, alternative financing platforms peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowd, crowd, uh, equity crowdfunding, and market-based lending. The second one in the IOSCO report is uh, retail trading and investment platforms. That's basically moving uh, some of the, the investment activities at the retail, retail level online, away from uh, client advisors and so on to to online services. This is not a new trend, right? We had uh, Charles Schwab and so on have been around for, for quite a while, but it's just uh, <coughs> uh, continuing uh, what has been happening for quite a while. And the third one is uh, institutional trading platforms. That's basically fixed income markets for institutional investors, how, how they invest in in bonds, how they access the, the platforms, and they're clearly the, the trend is to uh, API-based access to, to the platforms. And fourth, uh, IOSCO has a section on, on digital ledger technology. Interestingly, this is not really a product like the other three, it's a technology, and I will talk about this uh, more later, uh, what the implications are. And finally, uh, IOSCO points out uh, other areas of innovations with some, some overlap, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, rec tech, cybersecurity is a big topic, and cloud-based uh, technologies. Let me now turn to the, to the risks that are typically associated with uh, fintech. Here I also borrow from, from the FSB report. The FSB report uh, distinguishes between microfinancial risks and, and macrofinancial risk, microfinancial risks being the risks inherent to, to any institution, and the macrofinancial uh, risks obviously are those that are more systemic uh, for, the, for, the, for the whole system. And typically, when we talk about financial stability, we are worried about macrofinancial risks. So let me talk quickly about the microfinancial risk. In fact, uh, if you go through the maturity mismatch, liquidity mismatch, leverage, 
operational risk. These are standard risks like that, say, banking supervisors have been, de have been dealing with for, for forever, like maturity mismatch is at the core of the banking system, liquidity mismatch too, leverage, the endowment with capital is very important, and, and operational risk uh, issues too. So in that sense, in fintech, we, we have exactly the same, the same risks as we have, in, in, if you want, in, in the traditional system. W one difference maybe is governance. If you think of a decentralized uh, system like a, a digital currency, you don't have a board that is running the system. It's all decentralized by the user. So, so th this may be different from, from a typical bank, right? That you don't have, a, you have a different a democratic uh, governance structure in, in, a, in blockchain technology. But, but other than that, I think that the risks are pretty, pretty similar. Of course, everyone is also worried about third party uh, reliance. Uh, but this is also not new, right? Banks have been outsourcing activities forever, so now they, they outsource some activities to, to fintech companies. Then on macrofinancial, uh, the, the risks uh, stated by the, by the FSB is excessive credit growth. Say, uh, if we have uh, crowd, crowdfunding platforms, they are eager to grow very quickly, right? So they they may cut some corners in terms of uh, who, gets, who gets a credit. They are very aggressive in, uh, in attracting uh, funding from, from investors, so they, they may provide uh, uh, high interest rates to attract them. So this can lead to, to too much credit growth. The second one is increased interconnectedness and, and correlations you can think of that you have all these, uh, a lot of crowdfunding platforms, and then one gets into trouble, and this then has an effect on, on the others. Everyone thinks, you know, these guys are also undercapitalized, and so on. And finally, and I think that's, that's an interesting macrofinancial risk, it's uh, incentives for greater risk taking uh, by incumbent institutions. Think of, of a bank that is in the lending business, and it is now challenged by, by fintech crowdfunding startups, and they are losing business. So the bank wants to business or margins. The banking sector wants to respond and also takes more risks. So, so there can be an interplay uh, through increased uh, competition that uh, can lead to, to financial stability risks. But still, the FSB then concludes, and I quote, there are currently no compelling financial stability risks emerging from fintech innovation. So the assessment of the FSB is uh, so far so good. We don't see an increase in, in financial stability risks. The FSB also mentions that the data is quite poor, right? That there is not a lot of data on which this uh, judgment is based. And I think that's, that's also uh, a valid point. But what about the other way around, right? We say that we don't see any indication that risks have gone up, but do we have indication that risks actually have gone down through fintech? And uh, there we can think of several areas where fin fintech can actually reduce the risks, right? The first one obviously is decentralization and diversification. If you have new, new players in the market, uh, you can think that the risks are spread more evenly, and that's good for financial uh, stability. The second one is efficiency. Like many of the fintech applications make the, the financial system more, more efficient. It's easier to, uh, to communicate with your financial institution. Uh, maybe the, the risk management becomes better, so innovation can make the system more efficient, and, and that's good. There's also more transparency in the market, if you think uh, of uh, blockchain technology, where for the first time you really have uh, transparency on the market, on what's going on, on the volume, 
these are things we, we have not had in, in the future. And lastly, it's about access and convenience. FinTech is often about making uh, the access to financial services easier, right? We, we don't want to spend half an hour on the phone to, to get the problem solved. We want to uh, solve this online and quickly. But uh, finally, I think uh, a key point to me is technology does not eliminate credit risk, right? Technology can make the system more efficient, can spread risks a little bit more, but credit risk will never disappear. If the borrower is not paying back, technology is not going to help you. And I think that's important to, to keep in mind. Uh, also from a central bank perspective, we should uh, be aware that risks may move around at the corners and so on, but they will always be there. Now in the, the next part of my presentation, I, I want to talk a little bit about blockchain technology and what the implications at the system level may be of how the system functions. And uh, before I can do that, I have to quickly go through how the current system works. And I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with the basic structure of today's financial system. It's based on a lot of centralized institutions, banks, and financial market infrastructures. We have, uh, in the area of financial market infrastructures, we have, we have the core infrastructures, which are uh, exchanges, where trades are made in a centralized way. Uh, we may have uh, central counterparties, where derivatives are cleared. We have uh, CSDs, central securities depositories, where uh, securities uh, are stored electronically. We have uh, uh, large value payment systems, RTGS systems that are typically run by, by the central banks. In these systems, we, banks make, make payments. Then we have a lot of banks uh, uh, in every country, and they serve uh, the population. And the banks connect the population through the infrastructures, through the financial markets. When we look at banks, it's important to, to realize that all banks use what is called uh, relational databases. They store the records of the transactions in a database, and, and they are not the same. Like every bank has its own database, and there's no guarantee that the records for a transaction are identical between two banks. Think of an over-the-counter derivative. They are able to, to exchange information on the transaction through messaging systems, but what is thought is not necessarily the same. So there can be a discrepancy between the records between uh, these uh, two, two institutions. A few words on data centers, that's also important for what I will talk about later. The big financial market infrastructures, they have typically two databases, two, two data centers, where the transactions are mirrored in real time. So they have two centers, and uh, <coughs> if one center goes down, they can switch within seconds to the second site. So they always send the information back and forth. So they have two centers, and uh, so, of course, this is a vulnerability in the sense that if one of the centers go down or two centers go down, are attacked, then the whole system uh, breaks down. So we have a lot of centralization weak points in terms of the data centers. There are only two, and I would say one of the weak points is also that, uh, <coughs> that the records in, within the banks for certain transactions are not the same. There are workarounds through these standardized messaging center, uh, systems, but it's costly, right? So it's, it's not very efficient to work with a potentially different data, uh, data sets. So now let's move to, to the blockchain. 
which is, uh, in essence, it's, it's a new database. The first uh, change in the blockchain is that it standardizes the data formats. So if you have a blockchain transaction, you are sure that both sides of the transaction have exactly the same record. This is new. This is not always the case. The second change is that the blockchain is, uh, is a distributed system. You see here in the square, there are uh, different nodes, uh, six nodes here. These are, in essence, data centers that store the records. Like in the old world, we had two data centers. In the blockchain world, we have, uh, in this case, six or more uh, centers where exactly the same record is stored. So it's more, more dispersed. And uh, the third difference is that uh, there's no central entity that validates the transactions. Everyone who runs the node in a system gets a transaction and validates it and says this uh, is a valid transaction. Sender A really had the money that was sent and if all of them agree, then the payment is, is uh, forwarded to, to the recipient. I think the, the drawbacks of this system are pretty, pretty obvious, right? We move from two data centers to many data centers. So this is operationally heavy, right? Instead of sending the, the data between two centers, the data has to be sent to many centers and they have to agree that the data is, is valid. So, and we see this in today's world, all the digital ledger applications, they are very slow. They cannot compete with the high speed of, of the current system. So, but over time, as we know, processing power becomes more, uh, <coughs> increases, these uh, deficiencies will go away. And the big difference, of course, is there is no center here. Right? So we have, uh, it's a slow system, but we do not need a central uh, agency that, that runs, runs the system. And I think that this is where the big, big uh, efficiency gains will lie in the future. So if we look, this is just a simple example of a, of a payment, we can expand this to the financial system. And there are quite a few companies working on, on a new concept for a financial system. So uh, what I, I showed here is if, how would a financial system look like that is run on, on the blockchain? You see here uh, uh, the, the first uh, <coughs> The first horizontal uh, bar is asset one. Let's assume this is a security, a certain type of security. It's all uh, stored on the blockchain, different blocks. Every block has a, a few transactions in it. They're all linked to, uh, with each other. Uh, so, <coughs> so this is the first one is asset one. And then the second one, for instance, is, is the money, right? Where, where we can think of if we uh, trade stock X against money, we need to exchange the, the asset against money. So we can have money on the blockchain too. And what we do is we link these two blockchains together and we can exchange uh, the ownership of the money and the security simultaneously uh, in, in, in the blockchain. One of the questions is where does trading take place? And one of the possible innovations is really that also trading becomes very, becomes decentralized. You trade in the future, in the blockchain world, you trade in the network. There is no need for an exchange. There is no need for a central securities depository because the assets are all stored on the blockchain. So there's a potential for a very drastic decentralization 
of how the financial system works. What we, I showed you before, the system with uh, large value payment systems, securities depositories, exchanges may no longer be needed if all assets are on the blockchain. What's also interesting, I think, is that by the, by the capability to link blockchains, we can provide uh, delivery versus payment pretty much the way we do it today. There's no credit risk in settlement. We can settle immediately because we don't have to wait anymore. We trade, we settle without credit risk uh, through linked blockchains. So this is all possible or should be possible in a few years. One interesting question, I think, is also for central banks, what is a settlement asset? What is money on the blockchain? Who provides that money? Is it the central bank who says, okay, we provide digitalized Chilean pesos on the blockchain that you can use for settlement like this? Is it the banking community that says, okay, today we provide accounts to our customers, in the future we provide tokenized money on the blockchain that we use for settlement. Or maybe in the future, <laughs> and uh, we can think of a world where we don't need money anymore to settle transactions. Like we can settle in any other asset on the blockchain. We could settle from a technological point of view. We could settle a share of Apple, Apple stock, on a blockchain against a small piece of land somewhere or a small piece of gold or whatever it is. Like the second blockchain can be anything. And I think for uh, central banks, that's something they should think about, right? How do we, what is our role as a provider of the settlement asset in a blockchain uh, driven world? So, uh, but I think when I talk to people who work on these systems, on decentralized exchanges and so on, pretty much before, and then I ask them, but will it really happen? We you know you can, the technology may be ready, but we have to migrate there. And, uh, and that's, I think that's a tricky part, right? We have a financial system that works quite well. We have a financial system that has markets. We have a financial system that has exchanges. We have a financial system that uh, takes care of most of the settlement risk through delivery versus payment, through linking all of these systems. Why should they move to a new world? And we have something that is working. And, and I think that's where the the key point is, you know, why should we move to a blockchain system? And there, I think, the answer could be that it's cheaper, right? That we have more standardization in the world, uh, we have less, we have more straight through processing, we have a decentralized storage system that if there is a tech on one of the nodes, the system is still running. So there are quite a few benefits, but still, how can we move to that system? And I think that's the, this will be the, the key challenge in the future. And right? it's nice to have a great solution, but how will banks move to such a world? And there, honestly, I don't have the answer. <laughs> it's, it's uh, we don't know whether this will happen. Maybe it will, maybe it will not. But I think what would be what, what would be essential is that enough financial institutions say, you know, we move some of the activity to the blockchain. Right? It, it would start small, there may be some markets go to the blockchain, after a while the second layer of blockchain money is added, and so that is a pretty slow transition to that system. But even, even this, in my view, is, is not, not really clear whether it's going to happen. And let me say one, one word about uh, <clears throat> operational risks. 
what I've been describing is, is untested waddles. Right? We don't know how we measure operation risk in a distributed uh, network. We are pretty good at measuring uh, operation risk if you have two, two data centers. We know how long it takes uh, to, for them to recover. We have data. In this new world, we have no data, and uh, we don't really, we don't have certainty of, of what we will get into. So again, uh, my conclusion is, it can well be that we have great new technology, but there's not enough momentum to really move, move to this new world. And this transition will also not be risk-free. And then finally, uh, what does, do all these uh, innovations mean for regulators and central banks? Like it's not just implications for the central bank. There are many, many other regulators involved too. And, uh, and I think uh, it was also mentioned before, uh, these developments have to be uh, watched very closely by the central bank, other regulators, the pace of innovation is very fast, and regulators need to be stay on top of, uh, of these developments. They have to understand what's going on uh, in the system, uh, what, what, are, what is the impact of new players in credit markets, in other services, and so on. In terms of the regulation, I think a lot of innovation comes from non-banks, right? typically an area that is not re regulated so, so heavily. So how do we respond to that? Regulatory sandboxes is a typical approach to be taking to, uh, that is taken. But at the end of the day, there should be a level playing field. I think it should not be that banks, just because they've been in the business for so many years, are at a disadvantage in providing uh, certain, certain services. And clearly, uh, startups should, I think the same box concept is good, that you have a light regulation at the beginning when you start, but then clearly at one point you have to move to, to similar regulation as the banks do. And finally, for central banks, I do think uh, they have, in particular, they should watch blockchain technology very closely because what can really happen is that demand for money in the usual sense will change quite dramatically and central banks will have to, to, to adjust. It's not so much a problem for monetary policy because a central bank can always set the minimum rate, the deposit rate, and the repo rate the way it wants. I think it's more uh, a financial stability uh, dimension that is relevant for the central bank. Uh, what's the view of the central bank when settlement assets change, when the settlement, settlement assets move to the blockchain? Uh, does the central bank allow for that? And uh, how does it uh, respond to that? Thank you. <laughs>